Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Get It Done and Give It Back. Uh, my recommendation for accomplishing sprint goals and growing Drupal at the same time. Uh, so most of what I'm going to be uh, showing come from uh, case studies that have come up while I've been building the, the CMS that powers uh, VA.gov, which is the Veterans Administration Veteran Affairs site. Uh, we're working with the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's three partners on this project, Agile 6, Civic Actions, and Friends from the City. Uh, if you get a chance to work with either of those companies, or for either of those companies, uh, you're well suited. Uh, we're a fully remote team. We're running uh, the CMS is powered by Drupal 9, generating a static front end. Uh, my name is Steve Wirt. I'm a project technical lead. Uh, and I live in Venice, Florida, and also fully remote. So part of, of getting back to Drupal, uh, to begin with, you, you have to lay the groundwork. Um, and a lot of this groundwork uh, starts before the, the, the project even starts and kind of comes in at the company level. Uh, at Civic Actions, we've had kind of a long, a long history of giving back, and we feature it as uh, you know, part of how we promote our company for, for hirees, uh, but also part of how we promote the company for uh, contracts that we want to work with and, and government agencies primarily that we want to work with. So we feature it on our website in a variety of different uh, promotional things, uh, talking about our culture and that it's important for us to, to give back uh, to all the open source projects, uh, products that we use. We also feature it in our handbook. Uh, our handbook is, is fully open uh, and available. And so we feature it there. Uh, and then we also feature in our, uh, in our contracts and any of our proposals, we try to feature that uh, giving back is a, is a strong value that we believe benefits uh, not only civic actions, not only the Drupal community, but also benefits the, the government agencies we've been working with. And so we try to feature it right up front so it's, it's an understood expectation as part of the project. And the other thing that, that I've found over the years is, has really worked well is to get the product owner on board with giving back, right? If they understand uh, the actual reason for it and not just, well, eh, it's something we like to do, but if they understand the actual reason for it. Uh, so we make sure that we discuss, and again, this is raised in our contracts uh, as often as we can, uh, but we discuss the value to make sure that they understand it. Um, right? Sometimes the community saves us, right? We find a patch that works that, hey, this solved our problem, let's use the patch. Uh, sometimes we save the community, right? We give the patch back, we fix something, we create something. Uh, it also, my personal belief is that it does a lot for team morale too, because it, it just feels good to give stuff back. Um, and that's been a, a big part of like keeping members on our team happy and content and feeling like they're making good, uh, good strides. Uh, and we feel like that in general because we're all working on the, on the VA project and uh, that just feels good too for a variety of reasons. Um, the other thing that I found is that it's important to make sure that your project manager understands it because it's often the project manager that's going to be commuting, communicating that with uh, the product owner. So if the project manager has good understanding of you know, what's, what is there about giving back that's important, what are the benefits of it, uh, then they can communicate it at, at key times when it comes up with the product owner. Hopefully the product owner uh, is involved at every step of the way and we've been very fortunate at, at VA because the, uh, the product owner has and they understand the commitment. Um, and then just sort of the, the same basic idea, you know, if you commit to a good ethos, you, ha you have a good ethos. Uh, one of the first things we try to do, like uh, almost as soon as the project starts, and I find that it's easier to get the, the customer to buy in uh, as soon as the project starts, rather than if you wait six months into the project, you go, oh, let's create a Drupal.org page. Uh, if you can create it uh, kind of from the very beginning, they're still in this phase of, hey, we want to work with you, we're trying to be you know, the best partners we can, uh, and they're just more willing to uh, commit to that up front. Sometimes it's a little, they're a little uneasy about it uh, in terms of, you know, it makes them nervous, so we're gonna have another page, another presence out there, but it's easier to try to get that moving at the very beginning rather than trying to wait six months into it. Uh, again, we were very lucky at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, they had a lot of um, 
guidance from the very beginning from U.S. Digital Services, and they provided you know feedback that yes, this is a great thing. Uh, so we were able to get this page set up uh, fairly fairly effortlessly, um, and it, it lets them showcase who they are on Drupal. It lets us tout who they are on Drupal and that they're using Drupal. Uh, it allows the the team then to credit the client. Um, you know, you probably everybody's probably seen where you can credit not only where you're working, but you can credit who it's for. Uh, and so just having that allows us to get that in place from the very beginning. So any commits that come in, uh, any patches, any credit that comes in is, is able to get credited right away. Uh, and then it's just a place to celebrate those as they come in, celebrate them with the, with the client, with the customer, uh, and uh, within our own team at Civic Actions. Uh, so we feature them regularly, every time there's a sprint demo, so every other week. Uh, we feature, you know, what did we contribute back. Uh, sometimes it's a little interesting to feature it because something that you contributed six months ago won't actually get credited, you know, until it's uh, until the issue's closed. And so it's kind of fun sometimes to see these things pop up, uh, you know, six months or sometimes even a year later. Uh, but you know, eventually the, the credit goes in and it, it makes everybody smile all the way around. So now for some some case studies, smallest case study ever. Right? Something's broken, something doesn't work in Drupal. It happens uh, as much as we'd like it not to happen, but something's broken. So simplest thing, if you find a patch and you use it, right, say that it worked for you. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of issues uh, throughout the past several years where you know, all it takes is just somebody to say, yep, I've used it, it works, uh, you know, tested by the community, we're ready to move it along. Uh, and even these you know, uh, carry attribution. Uh, so you can attribute that, uh, and usually uh, the first person that uh, says it's ready to be used, right, is is one is uh, gets the credit for that. The second person to say it might not get the credit, so pays to be be the first person. Sometimes depends on the on the maintainer. A um, bit more, right? Lots of times we find that you know sometimes we're on the cutting edge of things. We find the problem, nobody even knows it's the problem. Uh, we create an issue and submit a patch as part of it. And so that's kind of the, the extreme sense of just the simple step, right? There's, there's something's not working, let's fix it. Uh, case study number two is a little bit more, right? There's a new feature that we need on an existing module. And we often find that, it, that an existing module solves some percentage, 80%, 90% of our needs. Uh, in the case, uh, in our case, right, we deploy code every day. Uh, our CMS gets deployed automatically. Uh, which is a totally cool another presentation all by itself, but it deploys every day without our intervention. Any new code that we merge in goes out every single day, which means because of Drupal, there's a maintenance window, right? Where normally we'd be putting the site into maintenance mode, but at VA we've got going on a thousand editors right now. Maintenance mode isn't enough. Maintenance mode doesn't allow us to actually like interrupt their flow and say, whatever you're doing, please stop, don't hit submit, we're going into maintenance mode, we're switching from one image to another image. Uh, and so we found that there's a, a, a module called SiteAlert, which, which has uh, queries an Ajax endpoint every, every so often, I think we have it set to 15 seconds. So we can put up a banner uh, that says, site's going, going down for you know, 10 minutes uh, in the next half hour. And then at the beginning of that, we can, when that maintenance window starts, we can actually put up a site alert. We've got it themed so it literally covers the whole site. So you just can't get to the site unless you're sneaky and can you know, hide it with, with CSS uh, or eat out the element. But it basically blocks the users out, blocks them out, doesn't or, you know, remove their page. They're not in danger of submitting their page in the middle of a, of a site move. Uh, and so it blocks them out, and then it comes back down when it's done, says you can continue working now. And SiteAlert gave us 80% of that functionality, but they didn't have Drush commands because we needed to be able to trigger those alerts with Jenkins. And so we said, all right, SiteAlert gets us 80% of the way there. Let's uh, submit a feature request for, um, for uh, Drush commands for it and get that uh, so that we can use it. And so uh, we did that. Um, and, you know, uh, that worked out fairly well for us, and we've been using it ever since, and I think it was a great addition to that module, uh, and solves a problem that I think just about every other Drupal site encounters. Uh, so there's always a risk for that. Um, 
One is that the maintainers not, may not accept that feature request. And my sort of approach to it is just, well, the patch is going to be there for anybody that wants to use it. If the maintainer doesn't want to merge it, uh, you know, so be it. And you know, maybe the, the risk for, for us at the VA is maybe we've got to maintain that patch a little bit if something drifts. Uh, and in which, in, you know, in which case we, we take on that load, but it would drift if it was still a custom module for us anyway, perhaps. Uh, there's always the risk that, hey, only two people in the world need it. Well, you just made the second person really happy. <laughs> hey, I found something that works. Uh, so usually the things that we uh, try to contribute don't really fall into this category. They're more toward this one, but I still think that this is a good enough reason to do it. Uh, we end up you know, creating a fair amount of patches that the, you know, the maintainer just takes, it, takes the module in a direction that the maintainer doesn't want. Uh, or doesn't want to support, but we use the patch anyway. Uh, case study number three, we need something a little bit more. There, there is a module that gets us most of the way there. We need to invent it. Uh, and you know, we weigh that, that very carefully. Uh, but in, uh, in our case, we have, this should really be almost a 1,000 editors now. Uh, <clears throat> and we need to prevent them from du creating duplicate content. Right? The uh, Veterans Administration is uh, one of the largest healthcare systems in the world, and they have hundreds and hundreds of clinics around the country. Uh, we need to make it so that any given clinic can't create a service of diabetic care uh, more than once. And so uh, there really wasn't a, a, an existing way to do this, and so we put in a, a feature request, or put in a, a, uh, a new module. So we created uh, allow only one module that lets us specify things based on uh, basically like creating a cord of things that it triggers on. So it doesn't just trigger on, on one field and doesn't prevent just one field from being a duplicate, but creating a uh, where you can say this field com combined with this field combined with this field has to be unique. And if those are unique, then it lets it in. If not, uh, it, it doesn't take it. Um, and that's worked out really well. We use that all over the site in a variety of different ways. I just want to say that's awesome. I could totally use that in the Florida Drupal Camp site to prevent duplicate rooms and duplicate time slots. Right. Exactly. And you're like, I'm smiling under the mask. <laughs> All right. Right <laughs> under the mask smile. Yeah, it's exactly for that. Because you can say the title has to be unique and this other field and this other field. And that's you can awesome. do any combination of those things. And you can actually have multiple validations on it. So you can say this combination has to be unique and this combination has to be unique. Yeah. And it'll, it'll trigger them on both. So Thank you. Uh, it's, it's really been a cool solution that we've been able to actually leverage on a lot of different sites. Uh, the other advantage that, that I see from it is uh, uh, Kais Lefrage, uh is an uh, engineer that, that we've had for quite a while. He never submitted a module before, so it gave us also an opportunity to say, you know, let's, let's make you a module daddy and uh, get him started on that. And, and you know, once you, once you sip from that fountain, you create modules for life or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's also a way to, to grow skills. It's addicting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the effects is that the Department of Veteran Affairs now has a module uh, that's supported by the Drupal community. Uh, and so it's, it's going to grow over time. It's going to improve over time. It's not something that if it were just a custom, right, we could have created it custom. We've got more than enough talent just to bang it out as a custom module. Uh, but that drifts, that rusts, that whatever term you want to use for code just getting old. Um, it, it's going to drift over time, and so from, from that investment, I think it's a better investment for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, other government agencies can use it. Herschel can use it for <laughs> Florida Drupal Camp, right? It, it just has lots of value to it. Um, lots of times, right, we're working in, in largely the government space for a lot of these things. We recognize that, you know, what I can use here, I can also use on another government site. Uh, so from the point of view of like saving taxpayer dollars, we don't have to reinvent it for other sites that we're working on. Uh, anybody else in Drupal can use it. And we at Civic Actions, uh, you know, since we're kind of in the, in the government space uh, a lot, right, it, it definitely saves, uh, saves us. So it's, it's win, 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 win across the board there. Uh, case study number four. Uh, back in 24, uh, 2014, I was working on the Department of Justice website. We were moving lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, content that they had in static HTML pages. And we started building a bunch of like helper scripts that could 
that could do things for that. Uh, it was kind of building as, as we go, so it wasn't well thought out in, ter in, in, in our approach to contributing as a module, because it was just, let's have this little piece here, this little piece here, this fixes that. Uh, but in 2015, we contributed as migration tools, and just over the years, like we've continued to reuse it across multiple projects. And again, they're all government projects, so they're saving us uh, development time and civic actions. They're saving taxpayer money overall. And you know, we, each place may add more features and more requirements to it, but it allows us to, to grow that over time. Uh, common concerns that that come up that, are, that helps to kind of think through how you want to explain them. Uh, product owner might say, does building for contribution take longer or cost more? Um, project manager might say, you know, how do we manage the initial creation of this? What's the best workflow for this? Um, and the dev might say, how do you manage Git workflows? So just to run through those. Uh, from the product owner's question, how, does building this uh, for contribution take longer or cost more? My answer to that is kind of, Yes, it costs more, but it's the same way uh, fixing a roof does, right? You can fix a roof for thirty dollars worth of tarps, fifty dollars worth of tarps, right? That's fast, it's initial low cost, right? Cost almost nothing to do it, uh, but it's not going to hold up in the long term. It's it's not an investment uh, where an actual proper roof uh, takes longer, it takes time to think it out a little bit more, to to plan it out, but it has a long term value to it where you know, the, the fast fix is not going to be a long-term value. It's just going to be custom code hanging out that's going to drift, going to create problems later on. Uh, so custom code, you know, we often find like in custom modules that we build, right, we go, well, we don't need a UI for this. Let's just bang in some, some hard-coded settings. Right? We don't need anybody else to be able to change these. Let's just hard-code it. Um, we do it as a completely one-off thing that may or may not have patterns. Uh, it's going to probably lack documentation. I mean, this is not guaranteed under custom, but more, more than likely it's going to lack documentation, lack any kind of extensible architecture, um, and it's just going to be tech debt in a couple of years. It may seem like you know, the best solution to a problem, but it's just going to be tech debt. Uh, whereas Contrib, you know, most of us aren't comfortable putting a, web, uh, a module out there unless it has a UI, unless other people can use it. Um, there's some thought to how other people might use it, uh, thinking in a little bit larger perspective. There's usually better documentation created as part of it. We just have a little bit higher standards for it, uh, as opposed to just get it done, get it done, get it done. Um, it takes a little bit more forethought, but in my experience, doesn't take a significantly amount, uh, larger amount. Uh, it's just that, that commitment and the added, like, I'm putting this out for the rest of the world, not just this customer, right? I want it to be a little bit more polished. Uh, how do we manage the initial creation? Uh, Gov delivery bulletins, Gov delivery is like MailChimp for Gov, uh, and we needed a way to be able to send, send bulletins through, uh, MailChimp, through Gov delivery. Uh, so we built a module for that, again, thinking from our own selfish point of view, maybe that, hey, we're gonna be dealing with lots of government space, they're all gonna need to use this, so we might as well have this, but other people can use it too. Um, and how, what works for me and what I recommend is I create the actual issue queue and the requirements for those uh, right on D.O. So all the issues are there, um, and that way other people can see what's managed. I don't really feel like there's a lot of people watching, hey, here's a brand new module, give it, you know, being birthed, what are the actual requirements? But it also allows us, as we build each piece of this, Right? We get credit for it. So part of it's kind of like gaming the credit system a little bit, but it all comes back to uh, feeding the, the, uh, the customer, giving them the credit, making sure they're getting the credit too. Uh, but it does it in a very open way, and we're always trying to promote, you know, do this in the open, do as much in the open as you can, uh, so there's not mysteries to things. Uh, and so this is, is a workflow that I found that you know, works fairly well. Um, we use uh, uh, GitHub, for the VA and GitHub has Dependabot, which does a nice thing. So as soon as we create a release on a module, the next day Dependabot's got a, a PR like already created. Uh, we use Tugboat, Tugboat runs through the tests, and you know the next day we can merge in whatever release of that module is. So that, that workflow works out very well for us. Um, so we make sure that we use the commit messages from the Drupal.org issues so that credit's given pretty easily uh, and transparently. 
And then we just create a, a single epic in our own workflow, in our own, uh, you know, whether it's Jira or uh, Zenhub or GitHub or wherever we're creating our issues, we create an issue, uh, and then we just link out to all the, the Drupal.org issues so we can kind of track them there. Uh, and then, you know, normal project kind of stuff like, hey, here's a bunch of nice to haves on this module, but what's MVP for us? Uh, from my own experience, the more you can actually get in the MVP, the better it's going to be, because sometimes some of the nice-to-haves that follow later might not get built right away. Um, so I'm sometimes guilty of trying to overstuff the MVP a little bit just to make sure things are, are more complete. Uh, from a developer, right, how do you manage the Git workflow? There's tons, you know, like if you ask any developer here, they're going to give you a different possible solution. None of them is more right than the other. Uh, but here's what I find works for me and uh, people on my team for like being able to contribute and switch between a, a, uh, a module that we're uh, developing and giving back and at the same time like using at the same time. So uh, one that I, I use fair, that I personally use fairly often is I just I create the, the module and I have that repo someplace else. And then I just create a, a bash command that just moves the dot git into the actual site. So then I can do uh, commits and things here to this without having to deal with like git submodules and that mess. Um, the, the nice part about this is that I work here, so I'm developing here and I can test it immediately. The drawback to it is if I do a composer install, that gets wiped out and I've lost all my work. So I have to be like very sensitive to that, like I can't do a composer install. Uh, if I uh, have work in progress here. So the flip side, the safer side to that, and probably what I should do more often, but I find it annoying, is do my work over here and have a bash command that just copies it all over here. And that way I, I don't risk blowing it out, but what I risk when I'm testing is that I, you know, like, hey, this didn't work. Did I actually move that, right? Or did I just imagine that I go, ah, crap, move it again, clear the cache, test it. Oh, yeah, it didn't work. Okay, I had it right. Uh, so that's why I tend to use the just moving the, the git, uh, just because when I'm testing, I don't have to get uh, caught up in, can I remember to do that? Uh, you know, the gray hair is coming and the memory is going. Um, so there's a couple of bash commands that uh, are, are here just for uh, moving one versus the other. Questions at all? Concerns? So, um, so that workflow that you just showed, is there any drawback to just developing it as a custom module and then when you are in a point where it's usable, then converting it to a, a composer package? Are there any batches there? Um, Contributing it as a custom package or just create it? Like when you're developing it, just developing it as a custom module for the site with the ob obvious intent that it's going to be the module. But I guess right. you lose sight of like the, the issue queue and being able to, to show the transparency and to continuously update. Right. So, yeah. So, like the first part of that is just sort of selfish. Then there's just like one commit that appears for that module. And it's like, here, here, birth is a fully formed, you know, fledgling module. Um, so that, that's the one drawback I see to it. Part of the drawback, I, the other drawback is mainly um, probably leftover baggage from when like Drupal 7 used to have a hissy fit when you moved a module from contrib to, you know, like probably with Composer that really isn't as much of an issue anymore. Uh, but just it's like why well, deal with all the moving around of having, having this module and having all its references in the database reference it here and then we're going to shift it to here. Um, that risk, I don't know, I guess I haven't run into that problem in the, since moving to Drupal 8, but I think there's still, I think there might still be some risk there. Uh, and especially because we'd be going from, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it does complain. What's that? It does complain. It's still complain. Okay. Thank you for confirming that. I figured it had, but I haven't run into that because I haven't done that in a while. But uh, yeah, sometimes Drupal just gets bent out of shape if you move its cheese when it's not looking. Uh, so, but from my point of view, it's, it's just the, the openness part of it. Um, it's certainly faster to develop probably the way you described and, and just, you know, build it all, all custom locally with the idea that you're going to give it back and move it and then move it all later. 
I've just found that, that contributing it right from the, from the get-go helps. Uh, there's a couple changes that happened uh, with D.O. It used to be like you could namespace a, uh, you couldn't namespace the module until after you moved it out of Sandbox, like Sandbox wouldn't hold the namespace. Uh, Sandbox, I think, does now hold the namespace. Uh, there was a, a shift, I can't remember exactly how it shifted, but uh, so we tend to, like, you know, we know what the namespace is that we want to build, we kind of reserve that by, like, setting up a project page, uh, but then we don't want to have, like, no code sitting in there, so uh, that's kind of been the workflow. But. This is also helpful to, because you get the get blame, you get, like, a useful get blame for why this is the way it is, right. things like that. Right, you can trace every bit of its development back to the actual issue on D.O. Um, so the bash commands, those are just things like you make a change and you run that and it updates and you can test in your site? Right, so what I would do, uh, like moving the git, now the git's in my site so I can make any changes in my site. When I'm ready to commit that, I can commit it, push it to D.O. right from within my own repository. Uh, and then I may not touch that module again for months. Right, so the next time I do composer install, the git gets cleared out, it's just a normal contrib module. But the next time I need to work on it, I do this little bash command, it copies the, it goes and it, you know, fetches, uh, goes out to my, you know, the other directory on my computer where that module actually resides, fetches it, pulls down the latest code, and just moves the git over so I have, so I can immediately, like, pick up where I left off. Um, but it, it does have that risk on moving the git of, wiping out if you're not paying attention and it's happened but I still what uh, the one that, that screws me up more is did I move it did I did I actually move it in my testing the, the code that I just edited uh, okay. so if you sorry yeah. um, if you use composer and tell it to check out a branch instead of a tag it'll check out the git repository Right, and I don't recommend, like that, that is a, our team's about 15 people, and so that means everybody has that Git repository where it might just be me, I'm the only one working on it. Uh, the other issue I think that we've run into with that is Dependabot doesn't track it the same as if it's, uh, I believe that's like, there's a, a little bit of a gap there. Uh, Dependabot will read the release tag, and so when I create a release tag on D.O, it'll grab it, but I think if we're, if we're using the Git repository for Composer, it doesn't do that, if I remember right. Uh, but that would, if we had, uh, if there were multiple developers also working on that same module, that would be a recommendation, and, and we've done that on some occasions. But usually it's like, you know, one person becomes the specialist on that module because they're the one that gave birth to it. Uh, and, you know, so, so they're the only ones that needs the, the Git repository for it. The issue that I have with it is it's a module that the site's already using. I'm trying to be further developing on it. So the composer has it checked out as like, you know, 1.2 up, uh, but I'm trying to check out a branch. So I have to override what's in composer. And then I have my own weird modified composer that I can't commit or it'll make everything go weird. Right. Just wondering if you I don't run into that because if, if it's just moving to get and I'm working right there. Uh, you know, there's there's kind of no conflict there as long as I don't do a composer install and wipe out right. what I've done before I've committed it. But once I commit it, uh, and then we update composer to that latest release tag, uh, I really haven't run into that as a problem at all. That is the one benefit is composer won't kill the git directory if you do it as a branch. Sorry, say that one more time. If you check it out with composer as a, a branch, it won't kill the git directory. Huh. So you can do composer install and it won't kill it. Okay. But it does make it a lot more complicated than otherwise. So. Right. Hmm. Interesting. I've literally just like done the patch workflow between like I'll, I'll pull down a module, work on that on my project, do git, diff, write a patch, copy it over, and stuff like that. That's one thing I learned through the Drupal.org way. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you.